Toronto is a city with loads of questionable landmarks. A brutalist library shaped like what was supposed to be a peacock, but everyone knows is clearly just a giant concrete robo-turkey. <laughs> a classic museum that was sadly done in by the crystalline entity from Star Trek. And of course, our big dumb tower that was the tallest building in the world in 1975, but now isn't even top five. So tourists flock to go see it and go, meh. Or where's Drake? But then, tucked along Lakeshore Boulevard is one single solitary wind turbine. So if you've ever been stuck in traffic, looked up and said to yourself, what is up with that windmill? Then this video is for you. Or if this just feels like a weird place to put a wind turbine, then this video is also for you. The point is why, oh, why would anyone build one and just one wind turbine here? of all places. I'm Aaron Hagee McKay, and welcome to The Goose. At first glance, this wind turbine doesn't look like much. It's 299 feet high, with a rotor diameter a bit more than 170 feet, much smaller than some of the newer ones going online today. And why they didn't go that extra foot just to get to a cool 300 feet is beyond me. It generates about 1,000 megawatt hours of electricity a year, enough to power about 108 homes. And in a city of millions, that feels next to useless, which is why whenever you see wind turbines, you usually see a bunch of them. So again, why just one? At 21 years old, this wind turbine is getting up there in terms of age. It's close to the point where Leonardo DiCaprio won't date it. But this story stretches back even earlier than that. My involvement was a little bit of serendipity and a little bit of inevitability. I spent my entire career in wind energy. My first job was with wind energy. That's Hassan Shariar. He's the director of Windshare, the co-op that owns the wind turbine. And he's also the president of Adapter, a renewable energy technology company based here in Toronto. How, how did it all start? I actually had to find out myself, how did this all start? Greg Allen is one of the original founders of this project. And this goes back to the late 80s. That's right, we're going back to the era of big hair and even bigger ozone hole hairspray. Summer of 69 was blasting on the radio. Everyone loved paying Brian Mulroney's new GST and scientists from NASA had just made headlines that global warming had been detected and burning fossil fuels was the primary cause. And for a little while, even the fossil fuel companies agreed. Throughout the long period of man's rise to civilization, this blanket of heat-absorbing gases has kept the average global temperature around 15 degrees Celsius. But in the last 150 years, this balance has been altered. Since 1850, the consumption of these fossil fuels has increased a hundredfold. By 2050, global mean temperature could have increased by at least a degree and a half, possibly near a four. Of course, back then, Toronto had a whole bunch of coal-fired power plants, which is literally the worst form of electricity known to man for both our lungs and the planet, and sometimes it made the city look like this. It's another smoggy day. The air is thick and heavy with tons and tons of toxic chemicals. Yesterday, Toronto West reached 84 on the scale, and Oshawa's air hit 90. It was worse than Environment Ontario thought it would be. The smog is loaded with sulfates and nitrogens and the kind of fossil fuel emissions that eventually turn into ozone and acid rain. In the late 80s, there was a group, uh, um, they used to call them Environmental Action Council. They used to get together, try to figure out what can they do to help the environment. There was a visitor who was talking about a wind project that they visited in Europe. That's right, this wind turbine started when a bunch of regular people got together and were inspired by renewable energy projects out in Europe. I am too old for this. Yeah. A bunch of people would pool their resources, build a renewable energy project, sell that power to the grid and make a return on investment, which made them ask themselves. Well, why can't we do it over here? And that, that, that started that kind of like the inception of that desire. It took over 10 years to kind of take that idea, materialize it into a project, uh, which really became in its physical form at Exhibition Place. Why did it take so long? Well, because no one had really done this before. 
Not in Canada and definitely not within a city. Wait. Ah. Today, the turbine is owned by Windshare in partnership with Rankin Integrated Energy, a construction company specializing in renewable projects. But back then, all of that groundwork needed to be done. They had to form the cooperative. They needed buy-in from the local utility. They needed to find a site. They needed buy-in from the city for permitting something that had never been permitted before. All of these pieces had to come together. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, yes. You want to say hello to me? Hello. Hello. Hi. Even now, developing a wind project or a solar project is a matter of years. It's much more streamlined now. But now you're thinking back in the 90s of a volunteer group putting their personal time, energy, and effort to put all these puzzle pieces together and make sure this project would see the light of day. And none of it would have happened without the dedication of the co-op community members. And of course, the champions at Toronto Hydro, Exhibition Place, and City Council, which I learned included then City Councilor Jack Layton, pictured here in a Star Trek uniform with his wife, the current mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, shortly before battling the Crystalline Entity. So why is this wind turbine here? At the X, instead of out in the country where all the other wind turbines are. So coming from the era when this project was deployed, which was the tip of the spear, front end, you know, just showcasing that this is viable, this is doable, to where we are at right now, where you have procurements going on for uh, wind energy because they can be deployed much faster than anybody else. And for Ontario, and just like Ontario specific, there's an energy shortage coming up in the next decade. And so no other generation source can meet that energy shortage in such a short time period. So what you have to remember is that this project was the first of its kind. For the folks who created Windshare, it wasn't just about getting a return on their investment. They also wanted to show that this was a viable technology to the world. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. So this wind turbine, isn't just a source of electricity, it's also an ad for the general concept of wind turbines, for the people trapped in their cars on Lakeshore Boulevard. So, after about a decade of planning, the Windshare wind turbine was finally constructed in January 2003. It took about a month to build at a cost of about $1.8 million, or in today's money, one month's rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Toronto. And it lived happily ever after. Psych! But wait! Tucker Carlson's documentary told me that wind turbines are unreliable. Nearly 4.2 million Texans still have no electricity. Texas has the most wind power capacity in the United States. But the Texas turbines, which are not winterized, iced up during a cold weather event in February of 2021 federal and state subsidies for wind and solar that have caused an overbuilding of wind and solar in Texas. It's cheap energy. Big companies love it. They love to virtue signal with it because they say, hey, look at us, we're, we're zero carbon, right? This 20-year-old turbine is leaking oil. Doesn't look too green to me. Look, you can't run something nonstop for 20 years and expect it to never break down. It's gonna need repairs from time to time. So of course, this thing had some mechanical issues. Most notably in 2017, when rainwater damaged some key components and it had to go offline. That's right, a climate-friendly technology was damaged by the climate. Not textbook irony, but like I'll grant you Alanis Morissette lyric irony. Wind turbine components. It took about two years to repair, but that's not because of the technology. And because of the one-off project, this is a one project co-op uh, and a project that faced a, a bit of uh, uh, challenges in terms of components, the revenue streams haven't been what you see in typical co-op projects. Typical co-op projects, they're very well refined. Like lots of solar projects that are owned by co-ops, they pay very stable dividends. Windshare, just because it was front end, had some technical issues, but is uh, buoyed by a very, very dedicated member group, is a unique one-off project. So once again, being first comes with a lot of risks. And the current projects that are being built today 
owe a lot to these ordinary people who decided to take on that risk for themselves. Toronto is both the capital of Ontario and the capital of least value for money sports teams. But Ontario is also the capital of wind power in Canada with over 4,800 megawatts of capacity. And this wind project paved the way, helping Ontario entirely phase out coal, which is a huge win both for our lungs and for the planet. Now we only get air quality like this when wind blows smoke in from other parts of the country that happen to be on fire, which thanks to climate change is increasingly all of the time now, but you know, a win's a win. If you look at Ontario's energy mix, wind contributes about the same amount of electricity as gas, with most of Ontario's electricity coming from older nuclear and hydropower. But as the population and economy grows, the province is looking to build more capacity. Hello, maybe we can be friends? This is how I die. So, will Ontario build more wind? Back in 2018, Premier Doug Ford came into office and quickly cancelled a bunch of green energy projects signed by the previous government, costing taxpayers $231 million to not have renewable electricity. They said this move ended up saving ratepayers money, but it did mean the province still needed new electricity. The good news is renewables have come a long way. If you look at the levelized cost of electricity from new power plants, wind and solar are by far the cheapest way to add new capacity to the grid. And as crazy as this sounds, they're maybe getting too cheap? Wind and solar are supposed to be the cheapest right now, and they are. But you cannot continue on this trend for a viable uh, industry. You need to find a balance because things cannot get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because there is no value proposition in that business, right? So if you bring the price of energy down so much where the people in the business are not able to generate a viable return, then that's a challenge. Okay, I promised myself that I wouldn't do one of these cut away to the editing bay bits because Climate Town has those trademarked, but I think that last point really needs some underscoring, so Sue me, Raleigh. This is a great example of the difference between value creation and value capture. And those are different things. I'm not a business guru, genius person, but you can kind of think of it intuitively. Cheap, clean energy is in everyone's best interest, right? But imagine if you're an investor and you're trying to maximize your return and someone comes along with a magic technology, not renewables, but a magic technology that can give every single household practically unlimited clean energy free forever. Would you invest in it? No. Because there is no value proposition in that business. While free energy creates a lot of value, the price means you don't capture any of it. Fossil fuels, on the other hand, have high value capture. They need constant drilling, constant refining, constant shipping, constant dispensing. And unless you're able to somehow set up a fracking well and a refinery at home, good luck without exploding everything, you're gonna be relying on an industry to supply you with all of that once you've burned it all up. Look, wind and solar are not magic technologies, but the point is we've structured our economy in a way that disadvantages the cheaper and cleaner option. And that's kind of a huge problem. But you can help change that by investing in cooperative renewable energy projects. And a good place to start is at TREC, the Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative, which is affiliated with Windshare. Now, this is not an ad, they're not paying me for this. This is also not financial advice, but I put some links in the description of this video and if you wanna learn more, check them out. And I guess we should just go back to me talking about Doug Ford. So after six years in office, the Ontario government seems to be waking up to the idea that renewables are cost competitive. Now, in what stands to be one of the sharpest policy U-turns the Ford government has made, Ontario is poised for its biggest expansion of green energy in years. In total, the province has plans to add another 5,000 megawatts of renewable power to the grid over the course of the next decade. Opening the door to new wind, green energy storage, nuclear, and let's be real, probably also gas. It's not like we're expecting Doug Ford to suddenly become some sort of bike riding, purple haired tofu eater. But local communities have a say, so new wind projects will need community buy-in. 
The good news is that there are lots of small towns who already receive rents from these projects to fund their municipalities, like Melanchthong. Me Mel Melanch? Is it, is it Melon and Thong? If you're from this town, please tell me how to pronounce it. Like this town, who gets about 10% of their operating budget from wind projects. These are the kinds of models that can power the future. And it all started with one single solitary wind turbine. In a nutshell, this project is a physical representation of the power of people's desire to realize a vision. They had a vision, they put it in physical form. And when I joined the board and when I was looking at all these uh, members, it, to me it was like, this has to be there. This is a symbol. It, it's a symbol of their vision, it's a symbol of their hard work, it's a symbol of the ability to come together and do something uh, meaningful. That's what it is. Oh hey, thanks for joining us. Lately, this channel has been doing deep dive explainers into Canadian issues affecting the economy and the environment, like the carbon tax and the housing crisis. But this video is a bit of an experiment, so if you liked it and you want to see more content like this, definitely subscribe and let me know in the comments. You can support The Goose financially over on Patreon, but if you want to support The Goose for free, hit all of the buttons. Just hit them. Hit them all. And we'll see you in the next one.